Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. We are just a minute afternoon, so we should get started. My name is Raman Joel, and I'm with my partner here, Raphael Tachi, and we are partners in the Private Client Services Group at Gowling WLG in Vancouver. First, we'd like to recognize that while we are all gathered remotely, Raphael and I are presenting from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. Just a housekeeping matter as well. Um, you know, we'll be going over a few topics, but if you have questions, please include them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and uh, Raphael will, and I will try to address them in a timely way. We are presenting uh, on a very timely topic, we think, with our aging population and the huge accumulation of wealth by the baby boomers. You've got their increased lifespans and prevalence of age-related dementias, and then just the bonkers real estate market in Vancouver. So it's, it's a bit of a hotbed of circumstances that are very attractive to certain opportunists out there. Hence this rise of predatory marriages. And to be clear, we're not really talking about, you know, those May, December romances that some folks might judge or um, questionable behavior from a widow or a widower who in the eyes of their child might be a bit generous to a love interest, we're talking about elder abuse. And so today, when we talk about love and predatory marriages, we're gonna address these topics here. I'll start off um, by kind of going through the legal analysis of what a predatory marriage is with the discussion on marriage contracts and tests for capacity, um, what some red flags are and how you can set aside predatory marriages. Also, we'll talk about a couple of cases that are pretty recent and give some hope, I think. And then Raphael will take us through a pretty detailed case study um, that kind of highlights the, the practical difficulties that we sometimes encounter in either uh, recognizing or dealing with predatory marriages. So as I said, uh, predatory marriages are, in my mind and the mind of others, classified as a type of elder abuse and exploitation based on the fact that there's a vulnerable person who's probably losing capacity and somebody comes into their life with the express purpose of gaining access to their finances. Um, you know, you'll see behaviors which will be contrary to that vulnerable person's prior um, intentions or strongly stated views. And, and you'll see large sums of money going out <clears throat> in terms of gifts to the new spouse, um, their family members, putting assets into joint tenancy, creation of new wills, and uh, there's also automatic spousal rights that arise from marriages. So previously, uh, when someone got married, it would revoke a will that they had, and that was changed in 2014 uh, with the introduction of a provision in the Wills, Estates, and Succession Act that, for public policy reasons, was introduced uh, as a way to protect beneficiaries so that if an elder person in their life got married, it wouldn't automatically revoke their will. And for the purposes of today, we're really just talking about marriages, which you know are easy to identify because you've got a marriage certificate, uh, as opposed to a common law relationship, which can also have the same rights and privileges as a spouse, but which are a bit diff more difficult, I think, to uh, recognize. And there's a whole case law uh, out there that's been determined by the courts that outlines the factors that you look at about whether or not someone is in a common law relationship. And that includes living arrangements, Shockingly, you don't have to live in the same house to be common law spouses. Um, living arrangements like whether or not they have meals together, whether they support each other in you know, sickness and in health, whether they mix their finances, whether they're holding themselves out to the world uh, as being married. So a whole bunch of factors that are involved in determining whether or not someone is <clears throat> in a marriage-like relationship. Um, but uh, it's in some ways easier to recognize a marriage itself because you've got that marriage certificate. So there's kind of a difficult balance, um, I guess, if you're a loved one or even a bank or financial institution or professional involved when you when you see something like this, you want to protect the autonomy um, and the independence of a person, but also be sure to try to protect them if they are vulnerable. So it's a difficult balancing act. Our law states that capacity is presumed. 
So the starting point um, in the Adult, Adult Guardianship Act, uh, Representation Agreement Act, Power of Attorney Act, all of, you know, pretty much most legislation says that uh, capacity and capability is presumed. And if you've been involved with someone who's got some declining cognitive issues, you know that it's a continuum. It fluctuates day to day, it fluctuates within the hours of a day, but overall there is a progressive decline. And although there's medical analysis and, and, and medical evidence that can be used to describe whether or not someone does not have capacity, uh, the test that we use as far as the law is concerned is kind of a judge-made uh, legal analysis on whether or not they had capacity to do a specific task. And so interestingly, it keeps the lawyer, you know, the work of a lawyer interesting is that there's different levels of capacity uh, for different tasks. And we'll turn to the Wolfman case uh, in a second, which kind of tries to outline that. But essentially, um, if you're challenging someone's capacity, if you're saying that someone didn't have the capacity to get married, what you do is you have the uh, onus, you have the responsibility to gather enough evidence to show on a balance of probabilities that that person did not have capacity. So in BC in 2011, um, this Wolfman and Stotland case kind of tried to create a hierarchy of levels of capacity when it comes to, to marriage and, and such. And so um, the court said that separation is the simplest act and requires a very low level of understanding. Uh, basically, you want to know who you do and don't want to live with. Uh, divorce, also still simple, but a little bit more complex. It means that you want to remain separate and apart. So you need to take kind of that extra step to obtain a divorce and undo the contract of marriage, which we'll talk about in a bit. And the contract of marriage, uh, which there's a, a very relevant case from the 1800s, uh, is based on this notion that marriages um, and the desire or contract to marriage are very simple decisions that we make. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And perhaps I'm jaded and think that it's not just about love because certain rights and responsibilities arise from the simple fact of a marriage. But the courts have kind of distinguished between personal matters such as marriage and love um, and financial matters. And so I think it's a bit of an academic exercise given such, you know, uh, pension rights and property rights arise when you do get married or sorry, when you do actually get married and there are certain benefits uh, of getting married. Oops, sorry, I think I skipped too quick. This is Wolfman of Scotland and this is the marriage contract. So if you look at this definition, you can see just from some of the uh, words here that it's that's not quite relevant and it's a bit outdated. So um, the court said as you know, recently, I guess is 83, that the law is at, at law, the essence of a marriage contract is an engagement between a man and a woman, which again is outdated to live together. Apparently you don't have to live together to love one another uh, as husband and wife and to the exclusion of all others. So the key portion here is that they say it's a simple contract, which does not require a high intelligence to comprehend, and it doesn't involve a consideration of other acts involving others, such as the making of the will. And that's where I, I really disagree, because being married, you automatically have certain rights. Um, if there is no will, you have primary rights over uh, someone, your spouse's property on an intestacy, there's pension and survivor benefits, um, tax planning advantages, and, you know, uh, the family law equalization provisions. So, so just by being married, uh, there are a lot of things that come into play that don't seem to be considered when the law talks about the marriage contract. But why? Why do they think it's such a simple contract? And I think it comes from this uh, decision, which is that you know they want to uphold the sanctity of marriage, the courts do. And so they say it's in the interest of the public in upholding marriages, um, sorry, the interest in the public in upholding marriages is recognized in law by the rule that everything, including capacity of the parties, is presumed in favor of marriages. So the law already presumes capacity. And then you've got decisions like this, which further presume kind of in that higher threshold, the sanctity of marriage. They're talking about marriage as being really simple. They don't think marriages involve, you know, decisions about wills and, and financial decisions. So you have here, you know, the marriage contract, 
and and it being a simple thing. And it's all based on this case from the 1887 called Durham and Durham, uh, which I love talking about because it's such a wacky set of facts that are, you know, pretty unbelievable when you look at them through 2022 eyes. But even in 1930, which we're getting closer to the present, um, the courts have said that the test in Durham in Durham is set out in Durham, sorry, is set out and it says that to enter into a valid contract of marriage, you have to understand the nature of the contract and the duties and responsibilities which it creates. And so, I mean, I've been married a bunch of years now and I still question the duties and responsibilities that my husband and I share. Uh, but apparently the Supreme Court of Canada has decided that there's some sort of test um, that's simple that lets you decide whether or not you are in a valid marriage contract. But it's based on this decision, like I said, um, and I'm going to talk about that decision right now. So the Earl of Durham in 1887 wanted to leave his wife. And at the time, annulment was the only option. And so in a very clever fashion, he decided to uh, pitch to the court that his wife, the Countess of Durham, had become hopelessly insane. Uh, he said that the wife was also insane on the day that she married him. And in support of this, he said that she was a person of low intellectual power. Um, he said her coldness after the engagement was so unnatural in the circumstances that is evidence of a deranged intellect. Uh, she avoided walking near him. She didn't want to hold hands. He said she suffered from delusions and stated there is something dreadful and awful I ought to tell you. And this is the kicker. He said the fact that she did not love him was evidence of her insanity. And I just wish that they had pictures um, of what Mr or the Earl of Durham looked like, or some kind of description of his characteristics, because maybe he wasn't such a catch. Uh, anyways, the court found that the wife was shy and unhappy at the time of her marriage, but not insane. He denied Mr. the Earl of Durham's application to have the marriage voided due to mental incapacity of the wife, but he further went on to describe the marriage contract and said that it does not appear to him that the contract of or sorry, it appears to him that the contract of marriage is a very simple one, uh, which does not require a high degree of intelligence to comprehend. And he's kind of saying that uh, the Countess of Durham wasn't that bright anyways, but it doesn't matter uh, how smart she was because you don't actually have to be that smart to be married. Um, and so this test is based on the Durham decision from 1887. And it has all these elements that we've talked about. Um, in fact, it talks about the marriage contract, duties and responsibilities it creates, uh, reduced cognitive abilities, don't destroy your ability to get marriage. Um, and so it's a mashup of this kind of presumption that you don't have to be smart to be married. We want to uphold the sanctity of marriage. And marriage is a contract that doesn't really recognize financial affairs. So what, what do you do? Um, if you're trying to question or, or set aside a marriage for a lack of capacity on the part of the vulnerable individual, uh, and if you are successful, the marriage is void ab initio. So from the get-go, it's as if it never happened. It is difficult to set it aside, though. Um, you know, you need to investigate. You need medical records, which are so helpful, um, which are becoming more and more available. And you'll see from the two decisions I'll discuss in a minute. You need information about the circumstances of the marriage. Um, if family members, trusted individuals weren't there, if it was done really quickly and in secrecy, you know, that's kind of a, a red flag that this person is a, a predator. Um, if there's an unusual pattern of large gifts, uh, whether it be to them, to their friends and family, um, like I said earlier, whether joint assets have been put in joint tenancy, these are kind of all red flags to suggest there's some sort of predatory uh, relationship. And there are other ways, uh, as opposed to just undoing the relationship itself, to try and invalidate the gifts and, and the marriage, you can say that it was unconscionable that you're taking advantage of this individual that there is some sort of fraud or undue influence at play. And this is something new that I learned a few months ago, but in BC uh, and other provinces, you can actually file a caveat to prevent the issuance of a marriage certificate. Um, Interestingly, any person can file that caveat, whether it's a, a disgruntled former love interest, uh, whether it's children and beneficiaries uh, under the will of a person who's, who's vulnerable, but all that you have to do is send in a form to uh, vital statistics that say 
that you want to stop any issuances of a marriage certificate. And then it's up to uh, the folks at Vital Statistics to decide whether or not that caveat has any merit. I've never seen it done. Uh, presumably, if you know the commissioner doesn't know the circumstances, it's up to the person trying to become married uh, or trying to get the marriage certificate to try and set it aside. But it will be interesting to see if and when that provision is actually ever used in terms of a predatory marriage. So I want to talk about uh, two cases that have kind of recently come up. Um, there's one in BC, Devor Thompson and Poulin, and then there's another one out of Ontario, uh, which is called Hunt. So Devor Thompson was uh, related to a woman called Mrs. Walker. And uh, I, I imagine she's like these ladies you see at Safeway at about eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday when you're in your sweats and your flip-flops and she's dressed up makeup applied, lovely, you know, clothing, all, all set to go. The way she's described is, is kind of like that, that really sophisticated lady um, who had been married previously, had shared with her family that she never intended on getting married again. She proudly lived alone, kept a meticulous apartment. Um, and luckily, you know, she had a niece in, in the area in BC who, who helped her out. A lot of her family was in Alberta, and so she would often go back for weddings and, and funerals and, and uh, high school graduations. But over time, she needed a little extra help. And so her niece took it upon herself to become more involved in her care. Uh, the niece took her regularly to geriatric uh, medical specialists, which is key in this case, because there is a, a significant amount of medical evidence that showed that uh, Mrs. Walker had started to lose capacity and was in, you know, in need of some assistance. Luckily, she appointed, uh, Mrs. Walker did, appointed her niece uh, and a good friend as her powers of attorney in 2007. That was shortly after she had met Mr. Poulin. So apparently she met Mr. Poulin outside of a grocery store. He asked her for five bucks and then asked her for her phone number and address so he could kindly return that $5 back to her. And over time, the parent, or sorry, the family members didn't know about Mr. Poulin, um, didn't know that uh, she was kind of intimate with him or, or what the extent of the relationship was. It was described to them as, you know, just being like a friend. And certainly they had no indication that she had married this man, which was done in secret um, in June, 2010. And from that period of time between meeting him and getting married, her family did know a steep decline, notice a steep decline in, you know, in how she kept herself, how she behaved. Um, There's a lot of great evidence from people in Alberta who talked you know, who didn't see her regularly, but saw her after, you know, several month periods and, and could notice every time that there is, uh, you know, she's behaving more and more. Um, she's, she's had more and more difficulty. She would kind of stare off into space. She at one point had trouble opening a doorknob. Um, she was very forgetful. Her hygiene was unkept, unlike, you know, this fastidious woman they'd come to know. Um, and when her niece went to her apartment, she noticed that there was food in the sink and it was unkept and untidy. So definitely a lot of evidence from, you know, non-interested third parties who, who weren't beneficiaries under her will um, and then had no financial interest. So that is very, very helpful here. Um, so she had this secret wedding and shortly thereafter was incapable and died a couple of years later while she was in a care home. After she passed away, her niece brought an action against Mr. Poulin to invalidate the marriage and a 2009 will um, that made him a primary beneficiary. And luckily, like I said, there's a geriatric uh, expert who described her impairment as an insidious onset of cognitive impairment with the overall picture consistent with dementia, probably of the Alzheimer's type. That was a, a geriatric expert she had started seeing before the marriage, had seen regularly. So her evidence was really keen um, in the court finding that the marriage was invalid. But like I said, the friend, her friends and family, uh, their expert, their evidence lined up with the expert, kind of this progressive cognitive decline, a slowing of her decision making, and kind of a lack of awareness on, on what was happening around her. Mr. Poulin, on the contrary, his evidence was that uh, Mrs. Walker was the picture of health. Um, and so the court didn't really buy it. 
And I find it's actually interesting that his own lawyer said that Mr. Poulin was of low intellectual capacity. And so he might not have noticed the decline um, in Mrs. Walker. And so, you know, that was just a factor in him not, you know, him not noticing was because he was not that bright, um, but that he should still be found credible, which is kind of laughable when you think about it. The court then discusses uh, the test for capacity to marriage. They go over what we talked about a few moments ago, which is the marriage contract. They talked about the threshold for capacity uh, for the formation of a marriage contract, which again is that simplicity test. Um, here, Mrs. Walker didn't really meet that threshold because of all the evidence showed that she didn't. But the court did talk about um, the person needing to have an understanding of who they want to live with, um, the effect on their future, which is kind of an intro into, I, I feel, uh, acknowledging that there's more at uh, play than just wanting to live with them, but that there's future aspect of a relationship in terms of financial security and uh, responsibility. In any event, they found that this marriage did not match up with her prior stated intentions that she would never marry again. It was done in secret. Um, at some point, she didn't even really recognize that she was married. And so the court decided that she did not have the capacity to get married in 2010. And they declared that the marriage was void ab initio. Because she had been struggling with capacity issues for so long, um, you know, the 2009 will was also declared invalid. And the court went further and declared an earlier will in which the niece was the primary beneficiary um, to have that will invalid in any event. And I, I hardly doubt that, uh, I doubt that the niece was at all concerned about that. Then you've got this Hunt and Warred case, um, which, you know, all these cases are so sad when you, when you think about how people kind of fall under the spell of or find themselves in circumstances where people are taking advantage of them. And I think Raphael will speak to this at the case study um, on steps and measures you can take in terms of whether you're you know, a, an advisor or a financial institution, things that could be done to try and shelter these folks um, from this. But Mr. Hunt actually was still alive um, as opposed to uh, the earlier decision I mentioned and some of the earlier decisions that we talk or that are in the case law. But Mr. Hunt and Ms. Warred had been in a on-off relationship, pretty, um, a lot of turmoil. She was a, an alcoholic. Um, they had kind of, you know, had uh, several breakups here and there. And ultimately, several months before he was injured in an accident, um, they broke up for good. Uh, the police attended at this home that they had previously shared. And Mr. Hunt described uh, Ms. Ward to the police officer as not being his girlfriend. Um, and that was very important evidence to uh, show later that they weren't in a marriage relationship. But um, so they had been in a relationship, kind of an a on off, like I said, they had bought a home together. Um, their relationship fell apart and they entered into a settlement agreement about this property. And like I said, the police showed up when there was an incident and he didn't describe her as his spouse. Unfortunately, shortly after they broke up, um, Mr. Ward was involved in an ATV accident and he suffered a catastrophic brain injury. And he was actually in hospital in a coma for 18 days. Uh, his sons brought this litigation um, after you know, they discovered this marriage as his litigation guardians and were very involved with him at the hospital. They're there every day. Um, they had a previously very close relationship and Three days after being released into the care of his son, who I think was only like 21 or 22 at the time, uh, Mr. Hunt disappears. He disappears and it takes three days for his sons to find him uh, in a nearby town, uh, shacked up in a hotel with Mrs. Ward and having been married. So it turned out that uh, Mrs. Ward's uncle had picked him up on the side of the road and taken him to this motel and they had had a marriage ceremony with none of his family or friends there. And now they're relying on that to say that uh, Miss Ward was the wife. So the sons, the sons brought this um, action to say that this marriage was invalid and the court agreed. In the alternative, which I had mentioned earlier, it's something you can 
try to undo a relationship through the unconscionability or unjust enrichment. That wasn't done here because the court did find that the marriage was void ab initio, but it is something uh, in future to try on and see if that works. They talked about the test for capacity as the Ross and Potman case that we talked about earlier. You have to know what you're getting into in terms of the marriage contract and the duties and responsibilities that marriage creates, uh, which apparently is more than just taking out the garbage. Um, and they talked about having the ability to kind of manage themselves and their affairs. Because capacity is presumed, the sons, who are the litigation guardians, had the onus of proof of showing that their father did not have the mental capacity um, at the time of the marriage to, to um, agree or consent to this marriage. Thankfully, there's a lot of evidence in favor of voiding the marriage again, like there was in the prior case. And oftentimes, that is not the case. Um, but here, we had the police who showed up on his doorstep um, and who gave evidence that he did not describe Ms. Ward as his spouse. There was a pre-release medical summary um, before he was released after the 18 days in hospital that talked about his reduced ability to recognize his cognitive impairments, um, and it made it difficult for him to fully experience what was happening as, around him and to infer the consequences of events that may jeopardize his personal safety. So Mrs. Ward was, um, uh, like I said, an alcoholic. She had some drinking and driving convictions uh, and some, you know, some uh, orders against her, and she wasn't really caring for him. And the court went through a lot of the medical evidence and suggested that he just didn't know that she was bad news for him. And so as a result of that, as a result of the sons trying, you know, their hardest to look out for the dad and take care of him, um, the judge decided that the marriage was void. Interestingly, the court went on to actually um, issue a no contact order because Ms. Ward was, was just such bad news for Mr. Hunt. Um, so you, you have to see that this case and the last one are really extreme circumstances. You've got these predators who I guess aren't as sneaky as some of them out there in terms of maybe rushing too much into uh, this these marriages and, and trying not to um, take a, a, a long approach. But so those two cases, I think, give us hope. But I like I said, they are very unique because there's medical evidence and really credible evidence from third parties who don't really have a financial interest um, in the outcome that uh, swayed the day for the judges. I'm going to turn it over to Raphael now. Um, He'll talk to you about his case study, which kind of takes the elements that we've talked about here in terms of determining whether or not someone is in a predatory relationship. Raphael. Thank you, Raman. So Raman um, walked you through um, the legislative landscape around predatory relationships. But you're probably sitting there asking yourself, well, in all these really interesting cases, I didn't hear an advisor. I didn't hear an investment advisor, insurance advisor, or you know, an accountant mentioned in any of them, how does this apply to me? What hopefully this case study will do is make it real for you. Um, in 2019, CBC did a series on um, other ex uh, financial exploitation. And in that um, series that they did, there's a quote from um, Gary Clement, who uh, is a former RCMP officer. And what he said in that, um, expose that C CBC was doing around exploitation, I, I believe got adopted by the feds and the regulators. And so if you're a financial advisor, your insurance advisor, your investment advisor, this um, quote that I'm about to read to you really starts to apply to you and brings this home for you in what you do. So Mr. Clement says, what we need is to have our financial institutions ensure anything that's an anomaly involving a senior there's questions and red flags raised. Now that was that quote was before, if you're a banker, you would have heard the seniors code came into place. That quote was before um, the amendments to National Instrument 31103, which applies to um, older and vulnerable investors came into place. So increasingly the media attention around um, vulnerability and, and older investors being ex financially exploited, including through um, predatory marriages, has become um, forefront for regulators. It's become forefront news for the media. And so increasingly there's reputational risk attached to it. And then increasingly when the money's gone, there is 
um, litigation risk attached to it because as the advisor, as the um, invest the insurance company or the investment business or the bank, the a disappointed beneficiary whose family has lost, who's lost access to an inheritance because of a predatory marriage um, will look to you, uh, will potentially look to you to satisfy their, their disappointment. Now, this case study, it is what can you do and what are the signs you should see and what kind of steps would you take when these things pop on your screen? A lot of the work that I do here, um, we, I do estate planning and you know help people put in place POAs and, and wills and trusts. But increasingly, a lot of my practice is focused on advising insurance advisors, investment advisors, banks, um, wealth management companies on how to deal with these scenarios, helping them develop playbooks around exploitation and the different, the different guises that exploitation comes into. So let's start with this case. So M is married to D. They've been married for a very long time. M has an adult child from a previous marriage, C. And you'll see that the child becomes a critical component of this um, fact scenario. M is in her 70s and has lost mental capacity to, due to um, um, de uh, progressed dementia and, and is now in assisted living. D is in his 70s as well, but he seems to be fine as living on his own at home. The this whole file got started because C, who is a busy executive at a financial institution, noticed something had gone wrong. Uh, DNC have a good relationship and so they could talk, but you'll find that in a lot of these cases, how you're pulled into these issues is because the family pulls you into it, they put you in the middle. In this instance, because DNC have a good relationship, when things start to go wrong, She's unwilling to speak to D about what's going wrong and pulls in the financial institution as a mediator between um, her and, and, the, and the stepfather. A few months after um, M's, uh, M becomes in incapable, D's, D enters into a relationship with P and which started off as a friendship and slowly got to become um, much more than that. Now, I want to highlight some of the they had done planning, right? So in this instance, uh, the family had done planning. Um, M had a power enduring power of attorney in place where D was the attorney. And, and if D couldn't act, then her child C will step into D's place to act. The attorney could use M's assets for his benefit. And so this is not a case where there's no planning done. This is a case where there's actually a lot of really good planning that had been done. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what are the financial circumstances of this case? It's approximately $2 million of investment account held jointly between M and D. Um, they'd have been married for a long time. They had $200,000 in a private banking account. That's also joint. And the, that's a principal residence, about $3 million, uh, $3 million also in joint names. Now, the key um, distinction I want to highlight for you is that on their joint account, the agreement that governed the joint account said any, any, anyone between M and D could sign. So any this is the case for most spouses, right? You know, when you open a joint investment account or banking account with a partner, you don't say we both need to sign to be able to access the account. You usually allow each other to sign or to transact on the account without the other person being present. So this set of facts is very normal, how you could see um, a normal set of facts between a couple that had been together for a long time. What was the concern? What brought the issue to head? Over the last year, uh, when it became uh, it, it came to me, D had depleted all the funds in a private banking account, and was increasingly re making withdrawals from the investment account. Remember, they were joint. He was an attorney, but he was also a co-owner, so he has an ownership interest in the account. He didn't have to account to anybody. Uh, D had moved P into into uh, the home that he and his wife shared before she went to assisted living, because increasingly he. Um, one of the things that you'll find out in, in the sub bullets below is when things, once his wife um, became incapable, one of the things that he realized was life was too short. At least that's the answer he was given. That he wanted to live to the fullest and he gave him happiness and joy. So he wanted to make sure that um, he, he could spend as much time as, as with her as possible. So she, he moved her into it. Now, when, when the concern comes to the financial institution, they interview um, D and ask him, what, what were all these transactions for? And he said, I, I purchased a Porsche for P. I rented or purchased equipment for her salon. Um, we took a number of vacations where I paid, I paid for the vacations. And, and that 
he wanted a relationship of some permanence with P, seeing as his wife was not going to come back to him. And so that's why he was looking to move her into their place. Well, what's, if you're an advisor, if, you're, if you work with a financial institution, if you're a trust officer, if you, this comes across, what's the, what's the concern? Now, in this case, the family saw it first, right? C saw that, saw those things and got concerned and then raised it uh, to the institution where the, uh, the assets were held. The FI's view said was that they per permitted these transactions because um, both um, D and M, while M was capable, spent lavishly. They lived a lavish life, they traveled a lot, they bought expensive things. And so they did not see any issue with the purchase of a Porsche, the extravagant vacations. That was normal course of action. Why is that important? As an advisor, a lot of these things, when they land on your plate, the first question that you're going to get is, given your knowledge of your client, did anything, did any red flag show up for you? In this instance, if you can point to past behavior and transactions, then you can explain why this was not unusual, even though the expenditure was higher than normal, a little higher than normal. Uh, the advisor in this case said he did not, did not appear to lack capacity when they interviewed him. Um, and he came in for his annual um, investment reviews. And even though that there have been concerns now raised, um, he, was not, he was not willing to submit to capacity assessment because he was fine. He was just living his life to the, to the fullest because of what he's seen happen to his wife. C is unwilling to confront D directly about her concerns, but she then reports it um, to the investment uh, advisor as well as the head of the investment business. And so this becomes, it pulls in the advisor and the business into the middle of this family situation. So the first analysis when this comes to um, comes is one, let's look at M's needs is, and how she might be a victim of any exploitation that's happening to the uh, M is incapable. So she cannot manage her own affairs. She cannot see what's happening to her share of the money. Uh, cannot remove the attorney because she's incapable. Now, this issue becomes important to a financial institution or an advisor when you're dealing with an attorney that is managing property for an incapable person. There's some case law out there that says that your obligation is higher than when you're dealing with a client directly because it's almost akin to a trust in that case. So in this instance, you have a, a, fact, you have a couple who both own the asset, but one of them's incapable. So the incapable per, incapable person still has an interest in that asset and is being depleted, you need to pay attention to what's happening and need to take steps to make sure that what's happening isn't, ra isn't raising a likelihood of financial exploitation for the incapable person. Now, a lot of FIs you have in your agreement, if you don't, you should probably look into how including in it, um, that permits restricting an attorney's access to accounts if you find that they're acting improperly. What that does around these issues is if you see exploitation, you have a mechanism from stopping the exploitation and, and investigating. Um, for the investment advisors, you would know that now there's a temporary hold um, rule for you to follow around uh, investments. This is an opportunity to implement that temporary hold. It's a basis for implementing that temporary hold. Um, you also now know that you can you, you have to collect um, trusted contact person. And what that does around these cases is it brings in other people. It brings in um, if she was not already involved in this case, it brings her into it if she's a trusted contact person. You need to open up the people that you're dealing with when you start to see some of these red flags. Now, bullet four talks about if an attorney is acting improperly, then there's a basis to refer the matter to the public guardian and trustee to look into it. Now, why would you do this in this instance? Again, um, D has an ownership interest, but she's, he's also an attorney for his uh, incapable spouse. And you need to bring in as much tools as you can to try and look after the incapable person's interest, especially if these also being exploited because of a potential um, uh, predatory relationship. Now let's look at these needs. Um, D is, willing to, is, is not willing to submit your capacity assessment because he, he's fine, he's just living his life to the fullest. The law as Raman uh, explained around these things is that it's a presumption that you're capable even around your own financial affairs uh, and so if you're capable of managing your financial affairs, 
then, and you're not willing to submit your capacity assessment as a financial institution, as an advisor, your options then start to look limited on the on the client on that client's behalf. And so, the question that you need to then look at is: Is there potential for undue influence in this case? Is the spending a result of an undue influence that's being put in on, um, being put on him? So we, you look at that and you realize: one, you have an obligation to protect M because she's incapable. Um, two, D has you have to presume D is fine, but there might be a chance that his expenditure might be a, a function of undue influence. And so what can you do as an advisor? What can you do as a uh, as as a, an institution? Next slide, please. Look, the first place you look to is your agreements to say, what does my agreements, what are the tools available in my the agreements that govern the accounts I open? If you're an advisor, you should be clear on these issues now because of what I've mentioned before, it's increasingly um, public, it's increasingly um, being regulated around um, exploitation. And so in this instance, the FI agreement permits D to spend, spend funds in joint accounts for his sole benefit since D is a joint account holder with anyone to sign. The FI can place a temporary hold if there's a high likelihood of financial harm due to a financial exploitation. This is similar language around um, under the uh, National Instrument 31103. It's similar approach that banks have taken around under the seniors code around these issues. But if you place a temporary hold, what do you do next? Now, if you're an investment advisor, there's some reporting requirements you have to do every 30 days. You have to give notice back why you've placed a hold. But that some of the tools that you can rely on is investigate the transactions, interview everybody. Uh, offer if, if D in this instance, because he was we have to presume capacity and he was willing to submit himself, unwilling to submit himself to a capacity assessment, offer them independent legal advice to say, hey, do you understand the nature and effect of what you're doing and what that might, or how, what that might mean for your obligations as an attorney and as well as your own financial um, welfare in terms of the transactions you're doing? He refused in this instance. A lot of this um, play, kind of options we're walking through is so that the institution as an advisor, you can tell a good story. You can highlight how you've met your obligations. The FI offered supportive decision-making, right? So that, what, does, what does that mean? That means where you think a client's incapable or vulnerable in some way, you bring in a trusted contact person, somebody that, or somebody else that they trust who has no interest in the transactions that are happening to walk them through why you have concerns. Um, we think you're, you're, you're spending too much money, you have an obligation as an attorney, um, what's happening here? And in this instance, they did that, they had both people in the meeting and Disto rejects the undue influence and exploitation um, rationale that's given to him. So what do you do next? Next step. Next slide, please. So the solution was place a temporary hold on the accounts and the expenditures because um, then now you have a regulation that allows you to do this. Refer the matter to PGT because he's in his capacity as attorney, he might be, he might be acting contrary to the fiduciary obligations placed upon him. So let the PGT look into it, bring other parties to help you investigate it and see what, what other tools are available to you. The temporary hold, in this case, the temporary hold and the PGT referral leads to an agreement between, um, D and C, the child. And that the agreement ended up being that we'll split the accounts into two. D will have his own accounts. There'll be one, M will have an account held in trust for her. Um, when for, where first of M and D dies, the balance will go to the survivor. So it's still a joint account. Remember we start off with joint accounts here. The idea is to allow the person that's because capacity is hard to determine and because you can't control everything as an institution, you have to allow D to be able to control his own funds, but also protect um, M. In this instance, D agreed to resign as attorney. And, and so for M and C stepped in as an attorney. The idea here is that people can want to look after somebody, but I'll, being an attorney or fiduciary for somebody is busy and it's hard and it takes time. And in this instance, C was willing to overlook everything, but she, was, she didn't have the time to pay the monthly bills and arrange for things to be get to get done. So if you're a trust officer on this call, you might be happy to hear the solution here 
um, further solution was to have C act as attorney, but hire a trust company as an agent to deal with the day-to-day -day management of um, M's affairs. So here, what, that, what does that mean? You end up with, a, not a, a win, like I say, a win here, but really it is a solution that hopefully works for everybody. It addresses the concerns in the best way and if I can, you can't solve predatory marriages. marriages. You're not the forum for it. Come to Ramen so she can go to court and get a declaration for you. That is what we do here. As an FI, what you want to do is to say, what are my obligations? As a, what can I do to protect my client, my customer, the best way I can? And what is outside of the scope of my responsibility? Assets stay with the, with the FI because in this instance, C is happy because mom's interest is looked after and the FI is able to give the trust business company extra business because now they're acting as agent for C to look after mom's affairs on, a day, on an ongoing basis. And C is really kind of giving um, general directions and advice based on her fiduciary obligation. And, it's, and M's interest is protected. The investment advisor and the private banker learn more about the offer the trust the trust business offers. Uh, the advice, if you're an advisor and you're hearing this and you don't understand what trust companies do, please pay attention because sometimes they offer solutions to you that you are not aware of and you're going to, you're going to end up in situations where you shouldn't be when a trust solution might really help and you can help your clients by referring them to a trust company to step in and help in scenarios that are difficult to manage. And then the best part of all, is he stops complaining to the head of the business, which is what was, which is what led them to me. So everyone was kind of happy. We didn't solve the predatory relationship, right? We couldn't solve it as a financial institution. You could not solve that issue, but you could protect yourself. You could protect your clients and you could come up with a scenario that allows you to do the best you can in the, in the scenario. So I will stop here and then we'll take questions if there are any. Rafael, thanks for that. It's very practical advice. And I, I see that the uh, attendees here, like you said, are from trust companies and some financial institutions. So I'm sure they appreciate that. We've got some time for questions and a couple have rolled in. Um, one related to whether or not uh, criminal charges were ever brought against some of these unscrupulous people in the cases that I cited earlier. And unfortunately, no. Um, in those cases, at least, there was family members that brought civil proceedings. But, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see more and more mechanism to bring criminal charges against these people. And certainly the PGT, the Public Guardian and Trustee, has some more teeth these days in terms of investigating and taking steps to protect an individual um, more so than, than they used to. Uh, uh, can I add something to that really quickly? Sure, please. Yeah. Um, the criminal code has provisions around um, senior exploitations. Now, they're not great, but there's some. So exploitation by using POA, for example, this, I forgot the section number. I'm happy to shoot out um, the section to anybody that emails me. But there's now criminal code um, uh, sections that apply to exploitation. And so sometimes it's a function of reporting to um, these institutions. I, I thought I saw France, um, Martin Franson on the, uh, on the list here. Martin Franson works in Ontario um, with an organization called, um, Martin, I apologize if I don't say the name right, but it is um, police officers um, working, I'm killing the name, but it's police officers that are working for um, primarily on elder abuse issues. Um, BC has an organization that's similar. Uh, if you reach out to me, I'm happy to give you the names. But when you have these files, these are community organizations that can help you identify um, kind of like bring in the police and get kind of criminal law solutions as well if you need it. Excellent, excellent. Hopefully we see those provisions used more and more. Um, so there's a couple of questions here. What if the individual has capacity to marry? Can you, sorry, has capacity to marry? Can you challenge the will that gives everything to a predatory spouse in some other way? Um, so I mentioned in, in Hunt and Ward, there was an alternative argument that the marriage was unconscionable. The court didn't actually decide on that. Um, so I think there's ample room to, to you know, have that argument later on, but you can try undue influence. Um, 
It's also the case with a common law marriage. Like I said earlier on, we were talking about marriages that are defined with a marriage certificate. Mar common law marriages aren't as easy to spot sometimes where there's, you know, that's the case, or it's the case of the caregiver who claims to be a spouse. Uh, but if the marriage is deemed to be valid or the relationship qualifies, I guess, um, as the threshold common law marriage, um, you know, it doesn't revoke the will, like I said. And if you've got an already vulnerable adult, um, you know, who who makes a new will, the child always has recourse to a Wills Variation Act if they didn't receive just an adequate gift. But there's also the ability, like I said, to claim undue influence. Um, the burden of proving that is on the person challenging the will, and they have to show that on a balance of probabilities, which means more likely than not. Um, and they have to show that the will of the mill waker or will maker was overborne by the predatory spouse such that the action of making their will wasn't voluntary. Um, and we've said time and time again that everyone's deemed capable. There is some help through the Wills Variation Act um, revisions that were done a few years ago. So if it's a relationship that um, kind of has dependence or domination, dominance in, in the situation, like a caregiver who's who's got a lot of ability to isolate the individual. So if you can raise some circumstances that are suspicious to show that, that it was a relationship of dependence um, and it gives rise to these circumstances, the burden shifts to the predator. So then the predator has to prove that the will maker has capacity. This has kind of helped to make things a little bit easier in undoing transactions um, where there's a, a situation of potential uh, predatory relationships. I'll throw the next question over to Raphael. Could the alter ego trust be an effective tool to protect assets if the assets are held in the alter ego trust prior to the predatory marriage? Thanks, Roman. So I, the answer is two, right? It's what the law does and what practical reality means. So an alter ego trust is protected in terms of for um, potential family law issues if you end up in a predatory marriage and, and or if the marriage is found to be valid and it doesn't work or you're ending it. But the reality is if I, if I have an alter ego trust and I'm in that relationship, I'm vulnerable in some way, I will pull the assets out and I'll give it, and I'll probably give it away, right? So it's not the planning, um, as I did case study I walked, it's good planning in place. It's not the planning that's the issue. It is the relationship and the person's vulnerability to the other person that's the issue. So the structure might be fine. Alter ego trust have really great rules and could serve a function here. But the reality is if you're, um, part of a predatory relationship and you have control over the alter ego trust, you will pull it out as trustee, give it to yourself because you're entitled to all the income and as much as the capital you want, and then turn it over to somebody else. So it's, again, the planning here isn't, the, isn't like what you have in place. It's good to have good structures. It is better to address the relationship issue and a and vulnerability issue. Excellent. Another question here, when the PGT gets involved, what is the likelihood of them managing the funds and removing the assets from the advisor? Um, I'll take this one. I would say not much. So typically when it's family member against family member, uh, the public guardian might you know, take on that role of managing the funds more readily, but they, are, they don't want to. Um, they don't want to be managing people's funds unless they have to, unless there's a, a better option. So when it's family members, there's probably higher likelihood that they will get involved. When there's a trusted advisor and a third party, like a trust officer, very unlikely that they'll remove uh, the assets from that advisor, I think, um, if, if that was kind of the, the preordained relationship. But Raphael, I think it wants to say something. Yeah. I was gonna add a couple, um, from, at least from my experience, two things have happened on um, files. Sometimes they'll keep the, PG, even if the PGT steps in, they don't manage their assets. They are just, they will act as the attorney. So the, the assets stay where they are. I've had files where that's happened. I've had files where I'd want the PGT to take the assets and they won't. Um, so I've not. I've had very. I um, to Raman's point, my experience, at least on these files, I've been narrow when the PGT actually wants to actively take up assets and manage them. And I've had actually many files where I want them to. That's the solution that FI would like because it takes a problem away from the advisor, and they wouldn't do it. Someone has a follow-up question, Raphael, on the alter ego trust. What if you have an independent trustee in place? So now that's, again, the structure itself works, right? But remember, you have an independent trustee. Maybe they have discretion to distribute or not, but the person's entitled to all the income and as much of the capital. If 
they are capable. The case that I had here, capacity was the challenge, right? We didn't know if they were incapable or not. Can, can they essentially bring a claim to force a distribution to them since are they only, they're the sole beneficiary while they're alive and they'll say sardines be voce or something? It's the structure itself works. I think what you want to, like the structure itself will help. Why you really want to address these things is the predatory relationship and how you address that piece. I'm not saying don't do alter ego trust. That's what I do for a living. Please come to me. I'll do them. I think that they will they will help. But my solution here is on in these cases, it's not the structure that matters. It is removing and addressing the relationship that matters. So someone is jokingly asked, uh, thanks Troy, does marrying someone several years younger qualify as insanity? Um, no, we only have to look at Robert Kraft and he's, you know, I'm sure got a lot of good advisors around him. And um, so, as I said in the beginning, those May, December relationships don't actually qualify uh, or it's not evidence, I think that would support that it was a predatory marriage, especially in this day and age. Um, Another question, what is the reasonable amount of time to delay transactions if it is in the investment contract and is one liable for arbitrarily delaying transactions? I'll let you handle that, Raf. Yeah, so um, the National Instrument 3103 gives you 30-day reporting obligations. It doesn't tell you how long you can hold it. It actually isn't helpful. It's great. We started putting regs in place, but those regs don't speak to the reality of advisors. Um, so it says put a temporary hold in place, report every 30 days, doesn't tell you how long you have. The advice I give advisors and to um, institutions is this, is as long as you, you set the conditions under which you, you will remove the temporary hold, right? So um, client, I think you're a victim of, um, you, you, are, you we have reasonable basis to believe you are suffering for a diminished capacity or lack of a capacity submit to a capacity assessment or provide us evidence that you're fine to manage your assets and we will let you. And the client says, I'm not submitting. As long as every 30 days you're reminding them that these are the conditions on which we remove the hold and you're not doing it and you continue to engage other support systems. So trusted contact persons, the PGT if you have to, then you, you can put the asset on hold. The challenge is we've never had a case where it's been on hold indefinitely. And most instances, actually, this is the big question. This is the big piece that comes up in those scenarios. Is the client still has needs, like financial needs, right? Their lifestyle needs exist that you have to address. So as an advisor, as an institution, you have to then make a risk-based judgment on permitting certain transactions to happen because you're, you have to balance client experience with the protection of vulnerability. That's really what you're doing in this scenario. And the longer you go, you have to kind of set out what risk you're willing to live with while you resolve this issue. But there isn't a good answer on, you know, you can place a hold for a year or something like that. There's no timeline. Thanks, Raphael. Um, noting the time, I'll take one last question. It's an easy one. What is the level of evidence needed to rebut the presumption of capacity to marry? And so, um, like I said earlier, the onus, the burden of doing so is on the person who wants to undo the marriage and it's on a balance of probabilities. So more likely than not, um, some people define that as 51%, but I think certain factors would probably be weighed heavier than others. Um, age, not so much. Health and, and uh, vulnerability, definitely priority. Prior habits, I think, that are suddenly changing. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, the first case I talked about, hygiene and uh, just, I guess, it, her mannerisms had changed. So you just have to show more likely than not that they didn't have the capacity to enter into that marriage contract at the time uh, when it was done. So that's that. Um, I encourage you please to reach out to myself and Raphael if you have any more questions. We really appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, we're gonna be sending a copy of this presentation as well as a short survey to you by email and would sincerely appreciate if you could fill that out to help us in uh, creating new content for you in the future. So with that, I uh, wish you a good afternoon and uh, thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.